on the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. So, what do we have in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, we start off with the second part of the interview I did just before Christmas with Matt Billy. And then we go to India to meet another old friend of the show who is the CFZ India representative, Sartak Howler. And then, well, you're just going to have to wait and see. I really like the old credits. What's this then, Jeff? Well, Barry, we've had a letter here. We've had a letter from regular viewer Argyle Saxby. And he writes, Dear Jeff the Talking Mongoose, Why or why or why are there not more items pertaining to full scrap in On The Track? Well, the answer to that is that on the track is mainly about mystery animals rather than full scrap so i would uh, direct you to one of the podcasts which deal with full scrap like uh, full scrap world full scrap today or the full scrap journal now i had absolutely no idea what that was all about until i looked it up and i found out the full scrap is a type of paper size considerably larger than Fool's Cap that I had heard of. Good afternoon. My name is John Dand. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology and presenter of this peculiar little show and welcome to another episode of On The Track. Twice a week on Saturday afternoons and on Wednesday evenings I bring you a miscellany, if you will, of stories about hard science, weird shit, and surreality. What surreality, you ask? Well, I would have thought the fact that you've got a show about 40 and subjects presented by a bloke and a large anthropomorphic chicken would probably be as surreal enough. But if not, cop a load of this. John, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, much as though it pains me to tell you this, but there are more important things in life than cryptozoology and the other disciplines that we talk about on this show. And there are even more important things than elderly gentlemen dressing up in chicken costumes and generally playing the fool. Because although I tell you that looking at things through humour is one of the best ways of analysing the world around us, there are some things which you can't laugh at, and this is one of them. You may or may not know that my little brother, Richard, who's four years younger than me, is a clergyman who lives and works in Germany. And recently he visited Ukraine and he was so upset and appalled at the conditions that the people are living there that he saw while he was there that no sooner had he returned to his wife and family in Germany, but he started up a amazing campaign in Ireland, there's a company called Kelly Kettles who make these wood-burning kettles which do not need external power sources. 
in order to be able to cook and to boil water and to provide heat. And Richard has done a deal with these people and he has managed to get the Kerry Kettle Company to donate at cost these kettles which are going to be sent to Ukraine. And Richard is raising money now to buy as many of these kettles as possible. And although I never ask you to raise money on these pages for us, it's very kind of you when you do donate something, but I never ask for money. I now am. Please, can you use the link below and send some money to my brother who is doing his best to alleviate some of the horrific suffering which the Ukrainian people are undergoing this winter. I am going to be running this advert because I suppose it's an advert. I've never made an advert before, but I'm going to be running this advert every episode until the springtime. And if the war is still going on when we come to the colder months of the year next year, then I'll be running it again. And now I'm very pleased to be able to introduce you to American cryptozoologist Matt Billy, who has just written a fantastic book about cryptozoological books and how to form your own cryptozoological library. Well, it's lovely to have you here, Matt, and it's lovely to put um, a voice to a face for the first time. Now. Likewise. We've known each other for, what, 25 years or something? Yes. <laughs> but congratulations on your new book. I think it's something that's long overdue. Thank you. What, what was your motivation? How did, it, how did the idea of it come about? Well, uh, the easiest way to answer that is kind of the way you put it. It didn't exist. Uh, you know, I re I've read hundreds of books on related subjects over time, and there are a couple of good online uh, book lists. Uh, Shukar has one, and uh, someone else has it, but uh, there's never been a book collecting book reviews. And I thought, well, this is something that is within my ability because I've still got most of the books and so forth and would be a big service to everybody in uh, cryptozoology and zoology. Uh, I assumed it would take nine months. Uh, it took uh, 18 <laughs> to get it right. I'm not I had to order right. a bunch of books that uh, I have promised my wife I will eventually resell. But uh, here we are. And I think it's pretty good. Well, my first thought when I opened it was, why didn't I think of that? It's <laughs> such a, it is, with hindsight, good old hindsight, it seems like an obvious thing to do. And I'm surprised that it's taken so long before anybody did it. I don't know. It just, uh, sometimes it just clicks. I know Richard Freeman, because he was here last weekend, he told me to tell you that he was very, very, very touched by what you said about his Arlen Bendek book. Oh. Yes, I thought, I thought that was very intriguing. You know that they've just come back from the sixth trip to Sumatra. They came back about a month ago. I know, but I, I haven't seen anything posted about results yet. Well, there's been, we put out videos on our channel and they've got new handprints, they've got new footprints. Okay. And the most exciting thing isn't anything to do with the Orang Pendek at all, even though one of the members of the expedition caught a glimpse of what logic dictates has to be the Orang Pendek, only for, for a split second. But the exciting thing is that the part of Sumatra where they were has no tigers. 
But they, That's right. I did read this. <laughs> I'm very proud of them for that. For getting the film of the Tigers, I think it's fantastic. So you've been one of the um, sort of cornerstones of cryptozoology, one of the <laughs> figures of cryptozoology yeah. for a long time. What got you interested in it in the first place? Well, I, I don't know if you uh, if you can ever say where your first interest in something started. Uh, I loved animal books as a kid. I was growing up in Florida. We went to the shore, went to the aquariums, all that kind of thing. And I just started you know, reading everything there was in about about animals in general. And of course, that came to include uh, Bigfoot and Nessie and all of those other uh, maybe animals. And I kept, uh, I kept up the interest until uh, 1995 when I finally thought, well, I've seen all these articles and all these bits of information. Maybe I ought to put them together. And so that was my first book, uh, Rumors of Existence, where I, I deliberately left out Bigfoot and Nessie so I could put in, so I could uh, have a book focusing on the things people didn't hear about nearly as much. Uh, and that, that was a lot of fun because that was largely pre-internet. And I physically crawled through 100-year-old stacks of magazines and journals and stuff. And that was fun. And I, I've kept up the uh, the interest ever since. I think cryptos, one of the problems with cryptozoology is that everybody's fixated with Nessie and Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And there are so many other lesser known creatures which are equal, I think, equally as interesting and, dare I say, more likely to exist. Yes, Orang Pendek being an example. Orang Pendek, thylacine. And a whole host of smaller and lesser known creatures. Yes. In fact, like one of the things that's always, always fascinated me has been the um, night parrot in Australia, which it, oh, every yes. 30 years yes. or so, someone finds one and then they disappear for another 30 years. So, although we know they exist or that and they're probably still there we don't know a thing about their biology how long they live what they eat what they breed what we know nothing and i think it's a great shame that people don't concentrate on some of these smaller things i agree there's uh there's you know there there is just so much to learn still about the natural world and and some people are out there you know looking hard you see the recent rediscoveries of birds and other things uh, but yes as a, as a general rule the uh the star animals or the star alleged animals have taken over the uh the public imagination I'm not saying Bigfoot and Yeti don't exist. I think they probably do exist, but they are so elusive and found in such enormous spaces of countryside that it's going to take the resources of a medium-sized army to ever find either of them. And I think the only way we're ever going to discover the truth about Bigfoot is when one turns up as roadkill. I, I think that's exactly right. I think, uh, you know, if I had to to quote a line from Richard Ellis that I've been stealing ever since I read it, if I had to bet on Bigfoot, I would bet no. In fact, I have bet no. Uh, however, I deeply want to be wrong. And I think if we do have a specimen, uh, it's going to be like you said, it's going to be uh, accidentally shot by an elk hunter or hit by a truck. I think because if they do be, exist, they are that elusive. I think it'll be a truck driver who will then put the body in the back of the truck in order to take it to his insurance company to explain why he's destroyed his truck. 
Well, we have an insurance company here, Farmers, that that advertises, you know, that they've seen everything. I can just imagine calling them up and say, "Bet you've never seen this." <laughs> Most of me hopes it will never happen because the idea of a rare and intelligent, shy, higher primate getting hit by a motor vehicles a horrible one. True. But there's that little bit deep inside the part of my brain which I usually pretend doesn't exist. This is what if it did, we'd actually know the truth at last. Yes. And now I'd like to introduce you to somebody whom I first met about 18 months ago. But again, somebody that until now I have never met face to face. He is a remarkable researcher. His name is Satak Halder, and he is the Indian representative for the Centre for Fortean Zoology. So, Satak, the thing that you've been telling me about over the years is the bird. Yeah. Yeah, Buru. So, uh, firstly, uh, I'm a science writer, so I like to investigate about all kinds of creatures. And then I uh, found about the creature called Buru, which was uh, in Zairo village in Arunachal Pradesh. So, that creature was just enveloped in many kinds of different misconceptions and many different folklores. And as you can just uh, imagine that a place uh, which was just covered in lush green vegetation and forest and different kinds of uh, plains, plateaus and rivers and a uh, strange being is residing there and nobody knows about it, how fascinating it can be. Uh, so I started searching about the Buru and then after some uh, studying I found that how a uh, professor uh, um, and then uh, there was few other researchers also, and then a Daily Mail who started an investigation of Buru, and they all gathered some facts of, about Buru that uh, the Buru is a kind of reptilian creature with four uh, short legs and claws and a mottled bluish, grayish, whitish color with a hue of uh, white in underbelly, and all kind of different facts. So the thing is, I was pretty unsure that how, what kind of creature it can be. So I started co con uh, contacting the people, the local villagers and the local tribal people residing there. They are uh, Patanis, by the way. And I found someone whose name was Payang Tage or something like that. And uh, then I started my search. And I found few generals and few other written scriptures and accounts of that creature which was the tribal people was handling those scriptures, by the way. Tell me, what do you, so what creatures did the people who lived there think the Buru was? Yeah, so actually it is very complex. Let me just tell you in a brief. Uh, the facts which was gathered by other researchers were all mixed up. In reality, which I believe was that uh, the, uh, the monitor lizard, and there are also a special kind of crocodiles there. They are called gharials or gharials in uh, Hindi accent. So uh, they are residing in Brahmaputra Basin. And right now they are very endangered because of too many hunt, uh, hunting and killing and because of cutting down the forests and uh, because of drying of the Brahmaputra Basin also, and also contamination, so many things. So at that time they were flourishing so uh, the the whole niche the whole expanse was filled with pointer lizards and the gharias as well and those uh, Bhutani people who are afraid of those creatures by the way uh, they just saw them together and they formed a conception that they are both same so when uh, the researchers started investigating and asking questions uh, the uh, but any people who are just not totally sure about what the, those creatures are, they mixed up all the facts and presented it in whole mixed up and amalgamated state, like uh, the fork tail, the color, and the 
those kind of things are of the are characteristic of the buru whereas the armored plates and like uh, some st staying submerged inside the water and those kind of uh, characteristics were actually actually those kind of characteristics were actually of the gharials right so the thing was that they all get mixed up and in the accounts they all wrote down whole the uh, characteristics together and it fo it formed a new kind of creature a creature which was totally mixed with uh, mis mystery and misconceptions well that makes perfect sense and yeah. i think that ticks all the boxes for what the creature was described as but people over the years some people have um made uh, made other suggestions haven't they carl schuker um who's an old friend of mine he mm -hmm. suggested it was some kind of lung thing yeah and i was very fascinated about that uh, theory also that was a very astounding theory i should say and actually i also started studying about the those lung lung fishes and even i tried to correlate the characteristics of buru and lung fishes and i found many similarities also but the thing was uh, the points which showed that lung fish is buru was outweighed by the by those points which showed that lung fish was not buru like uh, in my research i found that yeah he was he was quite right that the bellowing sound can be uh, explained by the theory of lung fish and the feature of buru that they are submerged inside the water and the mud that that can also be explained by the theory of lung fish uh, and there are many other points also even i uh, added some points like the temperature and the humidity of the arunachal pradesh was perfect for uh, harboring the species of lung fish but uh, the if you see the lung fish it's very fish like it's very eel like structure and those apatanis were very good fish hunters they were uh, actually fishermen so i i think that if the apatanis have uh, seen the those uh, those kind of uh, lung fish they, they will be able to uh, understand and they will be able to get that it is a fish not a reptile there are six known species of lung fish found across Africa, Australia and South America. The largest of them is the marbled lungfish of Ethiopia, which grows to between six and seven feet in length. The species is found across parts of East and Central Africa, but for some reason the ones in Ethiopia are generally agreed to be the largest. Lungfish are a very ancient lineage, going back as far as the Devonian period, about 420 million years ago. But there are no records of lungfish in modern-day Asia at all. And although it would be wonderful if there were, I tend to agree with what Sartak has to say, that the locals would have been able to tell the difference between a reptile and the fish so the thing is the buru is quite larger than the uh, that lungfish and the largest lungfish was found the fossil of the lungfish which was found in usa was around um, four to five meters but it was uh 100 million to 160 million years ago and it was found uh so, something like 8431 miles away from Arunachal pradesh so obviously it is very hard that that kind of lungfish can be found in Arunachal Pradesh. And secondly, the thing is, I'm not denying the fact that lungfishes has been, haven't been found in India, because in Indian subcontinent, few researchers have found fossils of lungfish, but also uh, those lungfish exit, existed in Upper Terracic era, I mean, millions of years ago. And after that, no lungfish or the fossil of lungfish has been found in India. So it is very quite unlikely that any lungfish will be able to survive and thrive here in Arunachal Pradesh without showing its signs and uh, its evidences. Well, I think your research is pretty bloody conclusive. So well done. I think you have solved the mystery of the Buru. Yeah, what, thanks. What, what else are you working on? 
right now i'm working on a book which will uh, compile all the different kinds of cryptids which uh, is found in india like uh, let me give you some example there there is a andaman, andaman uh, wood andaman wood owl something like that uh, which they call but uh, nobody knows what exactly that thing is so maybe it can be a new kind of creature haven't been found yet or perhaps it's some kind of uh, old existing creature which people misidentified and then there is a, a vadkila monster in Ma- maharashtra and that's also a pretty strange kind of creature which uh, not much evidence has been gathered but i'm still working on that and there is a, some uh, someone some people and there are many villagers who believe on uh, a specific kind of creature uh, which is called pishacha in uh, and if in if you see say in indian accent it will be pishach and they are very uh, very dark uh, humanoid demonic kind of creatures who eat flesh and it's very very terrifying for me also i am also scared of those creatures by the way so uh, the thing is i am also working on that and then the few there are few kind of different th- cryptids like uh, if you go into crypto botany there is a, a, a tree which is called as cow eating tree in india but uh, in reality i found that uh, because of coincidences it f- formed a misconception and those people uh, in the village they started believing it as cow eating tree but by the way it was not that thing so there are many creatures also in india like uh, there is a giant python a very very giant and that's also a, something i should research on because not much evidence has been found yet right now i'm working on that on that you know that um about 10 years ago i think we sent an expedition to right up in the north of india looking for the mandibura yeah 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 the it's very popular and famous by the way they found quite a lot of um reports of it and interviewed mm-hmm. several new eyewitnesses and they even found the footprint which was yeah uh, actually i haven't traveled on that expense matlab i i haven't traveled on that area right now so i don't have much evidences about that mante burung or orang pendek or that uh, uh, they called ban manush by the way in their local language but maybe after few months maybe i will be able to uh, research on that thing also there's a lady from canada who she and her father are canadian representatives and she's just published a book about the mystery animals of um, southern asia and oceania and she's been particularly interested in the stories of the nitawo from I'm sure I pronounced that wrong but the nitawo from um Sri Lanka there's been a little, a little man like creature that hides in the mountains and many of them were killed when the village, when the local villagers drove them into a cave and suffocated them to death by lighting a fire i don't know if you know about that story uh, by the way i don't know about that story but in india also there are many different creatures which are dwarfs and like cephalopods like creature and humanoid creature and they they are dwarf and they hide in the bushes and uh, stay try to stay hidden from the sight of the human eye uh in india there is also many myth or i can say uh, uh some say sightings but many believe that it's a myth i'm researching on that also maybe they are same creatures or maybe they can be different i don't know perhaps they can be same because uh, as sri lanka and india is not far away even as i i was uh, talking about the buru uh, then there was a very uh, there is a finding of the very large monitor lizard in sri lanka also and the genetics of that that and that monitor lizard was similar to the monitor lizard of uh, in india so 
perhaps there there is a linkage between creatures in india and sri lanka also so maybe it can be possible that those small creatures can be what on what i am researching right now if you want to support us and help us make more content like these please press like subscribe follow our facebook page and check out our patreon and there's the ghost of Joe Strammer, who is an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, wants me to remind you, always press the notification bell. Otherwise, you won't be told when there's a new show to watch. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? And so, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another episode. I want to say a big, big thank you to everybody but for whom this show would not have been put together, particularly Graham Inglis, who's the Deputy Director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, and also is my carer, as well as being an old friend of mine. And he is the one who keeps me going, despite the fact that my ridiculously fragile body is giving up the ghost far quicker than I like to admit. And I also want to say a big thank you to Louis, my producer, who's an absolute gem and I don't know what I'd do without him. And I would like to say thank you to my guests this week, who are Richard Freeman and V. McCrinnan and Sartak Halder and Matt Billy, who've all been absolutely brilliant and I will see you all on Wednesday. What are we going to be doing on Wednesday? I don't know, but I can tell you what we're going to be doing next Saturday. Because we've got the second part of the interview with Matt Billy, and we've got stuff about big cats here in North Devon. So, until then, I will be seeing you. Mm -hmm.